now, as I had said, uh, this teaching is uh, on confidence, trust, faith, and devotion. And these are all woven together. In a way, it's almost impossible to look at one without considering the others. And they encourage each other to develop. They are interdependent, interrelated. So what I'm going to do is look at these from a, um, a uh, perspective of, uh, of different perspectives. So I'm going to start out here with a quote from uh, Kenpo Kartar Rinpoche. And um, it is that uh, uh, in true practice, what is really necessary is faith. Faith is the most important thing. I don't know if this English word faith really describes the meaning. I am trying to communicate here faith, trust, devotion, and compassion are the words that I use. If you have sincere, healthy, pure trust, faith, devotion, and compassion, that is not superstition, not just some kind of idiot trust. Then you don't really have to know too much. So the idea of having compassion in there as well is that we are traveling the path and we want to do this to benefit all sentient beings. And it's impossible to travel the path if you're not thinking about all sentient beings. If you're just thinking about yourself, you cannot progress on the path. So compassion is extremely important to uh, uh, throw in there as well. So faith, trust, devotion, and compassion, he lumps those all together as being part of faith. So here is how faith is frequently uh, divided up in Tibetan Buddhism. The first is receptive or trusting faith. This is our first kind of experience when we come to Buddhism. And one uh, Lama said, it's like spiritual awe. Uh, due to your karma, you're interested in hearing the teachings. Kempo Carter Rinpoche would frequently say uh, at the end of a refuge ceremony or during a refuge ceremony that if you are a Westerner and here taking refuge, it is because of uh, your karmic connection through previous lives to Buddhism and the Buddhist teachings. So because of our karma, we are originally interested in Buddhism, practicing it, learning more about it. Uh, again, it could be said that it's a bit like how a small child, this type of trusting faith, is how he feels when he sees his mother. That we have a certain confidence and inspiration to go deeper into these teachings besides just a superficial you know, experience a few times and then um, not doing anything about it or reading a few books and then putting them down and not doing much with them. And what we're doing at this time is we're beginning to develop receptivity. We are beginning to um, turn ourselves into a person who is more receptive to the teachings. 
and so that the Lama can have a greater influence on you. Now, the next level of faith is uh, yearning or longing, wanting to move to the ultimate goal. And it's a gradual process. Uh, all of these are gradual, little by little by little. It usually would be uh, uh, unrealistic to think that you can jump from one to another like a quantum leap. Uh, so uh, as you uh, practice more, study more, have um, a deeper relationship with uh, your teacher or your teachers, uh, you develop more of this longing or yearning to, uh, to have more Dharma in your life, to travel the path, and uh, to go beyond your present situation. So the teachings are understood at a deeper level with this kind of faith. I once had a teacher, uh, it was an American teacher, uh, say that the teachings are self-secret, that uh, when you're ready to uh, understand the teachings and you will understand the teachings at that level. And I think most of you have had the experience of, of reading a book and then putting it down and maybe come back a year, two, three, four years later, reading it again and go, oh, I didn't see that the first time around. And that's this idea of self-secret, that as we practice more, as our meditation practice develops, um, our mind clarifies a little bit more and we start seeing things more that we didn't see before. Our trust in practice increases here. Our trust in the Dharma, our trust in the teachers develops more here with this. And very importantly, our enthusiasm increases at this level. And at this level, or really uh, uh, at the first level too, we need to examine, investigate, chew on the teachings, ask questions, that it's in our hands, it's our responsibility to do these things. A teacher can't do them for you. So this is where the enthusiasm really becomes important. Then the third type of faith is conviction. And what that means is that your faith, your confidence uh, to practice and study becomes unshakable. Here is a quote. This comes from actually a Chagdu Toku Rinpoche. The conviction that we have thoroughly and profoundly understood an infallible truth, such faith is incontrovertible. So this is through direct experience. And nothing can shake you from that. Uh, kind of confidence, that conviction. And here is a story that uh, I have found in two different books. One of them is a book by, of Kempo Karta Rinpoche's teachings called A Single Sufficient Virtue. And so this is a story about a uh, a servant of a kampa. And what's interesting here is kampas are, that's where Kempo Rinpoche came from. Krangu Rinpoche came from here too. Many of the Kagyu masters uh, come from this area of Tibet called Kam. And um, people from other parts of Tibet kind of think they're hillbillies. Uh, kind of uh, not very bright. And in fact, uh, Lama Yeshe Gyamso, the translator, 
he once said this about Rinpoche's action, accents. He said, when Rinpoche's teaching, uh, if we could uh, put this into an American accent, he would be teaching this way. Well, come on, y'all, let's talk about the Dharmakaya. So this is how kampas are looked at. So here you've got the servant of a kampa, who's a hillbilly. And uh, so this great teacher, way back in Tibet before the Chinese came, they would travel and they would set up a, a huge tents and, uh, and they would give teachings and so forth. And of course, there would have to be a, a, a kitchen tent as well. So this uh, Kampa servant heard about this great teacher coming to give teachings in the area, and he resolved to go meet him and receive teachings. So uh, he went to where the teachings were going on, and he came, the first tent he came to was the kitchen. And immediately somebody, uh, you might say, corralled him and got him to help cooking. And he spent weeks in that kitchen tent cooking. And then finally, uh, somebody saw, said, well, would you like to serve the Lama his meal? And he said, well, yes, I would. And so he uh, uh, brought, the food to this Lama. And uh, when the Lama saw him, he burst out uh, in Tibetan, you've got a nose like a raksha bead, which is a wrathful bead that has a lot of humps on it. Because that's, this man had a very large nose and it was pitted and it looked a lot like a raksha bead. And so uh, when the, um, the man was finished serving the Lama, he went back to the kitchen. And after a few more days, he decided to go back home because he had received the transmission from his Lama. And so he went back home and uh, he then, uh, his mantra was, I've got a nose like a raksha bead or something similar to that. And he did this faithfully for a very long time. And eventually, people from the area started coming to him when they needed healing. And, uh, and he developed a reputation as a healer. Well, now, years later, the same Lama comes back to the same area. And he is giving teachings but he has developed a cyst in his uh, uh, upper throat. Could even be an infected tonsil. And nobody can help him. And so finally somebody says, well, there's this kampa in the area that has a reputation as a healer. We can bring him. And the Lama said, well, yes, do that. So they, uh, they summon the, the, uh, this Kampa servant, and he comes into the room with his prayer beads, going uh, something to the effect of my nose is like a raksha bead. And the, uh, the great Lama sees this, remembers him, and starts laughing so hard that the cyst bursts and he's healed. And that's this idea about uh, faith, that it wasn't that saying, I, I've got a nose like a raksha bead that gave him that ability to heal. It was his faith and his confidence. And again, Rinpoche told this story. So having this kind of faith, not idiot, faith, not ignorant faith, but this kind of faith is really important. And um, so I'm going to go back and I'll read that uh, quote of Rinpoche's that I started out with here. 
Um, in true practice, what is really necessary is faith. Faith is the most important thing. I don't know if this English word faith really describes the meaning I'm trying to communicate here. Faith, trust, devotion, and compassion are the words that I use. If you have sincere, healthy, pure faith, trust, uh, devotion, and compassion, not just superstition, it's not some kind of idiot trust. Then you really don't have to know too much. So next I want to talk a little bit about confidence. And there are three things that we need to have confidence in. And things maybe is the wrong word because it makes it sound like they're solid. The first is we need to have confidence in the Dharma. And the Dharma is the teachings and uh, the practices. We need to have confidence in that. So uh, the next is confidence in the Lama. That uh, if we don't have confidence in the Lama, then we're really not going to take the teachings of the Lama seriously. And then finally, we need to have confidence in ourselves. We need to have confidence that, yes, I can travel the path. Yes, I can do these practices to the best of my ability. Yes, I can change and so forth. So these are the three types of confidence that we need. Uh, in terms of the Dharma, that um, we need to read, we need to attend teachings. We, uh, it's really good nowadays that we have all these videos that are available and that we have this teaching going on right now. This is really important. On the other hand, uh, a book uh, or a video that isn't interactive with a teacher won't tell you if you've misunderstood something or if you missed something. So we need more than just books and videos. Uh, and that's where the Lama comes in. The, um, the Lama is really the door to oral instructions. And Kagyu really means oral lineage. That originally the teachings were passed on uh, by mouth. From Marpa to Milarepa to Gampopa. Milarepa didn't write books. Marpa didn't write books. And so it's really important to, uh, to have confidence in the Lama. If your practice is not working, if you don't think your practice is working or you feel that you're not getting anywhere, uh, it's not because there's something wrong with Dharma, it's because you're not doing it correctly. So it's always good to check in with the Lama from time to time. And um, so here in Tibetan Buddhism, we have the three yanas, the Hinayana, the Mahayana, and the Vajrayana. In the uh, Hinayana, the teacher is looked at as a, um, a person who knows the path, who can show us the methods, uh, and set a good example. And on the Hinayana, we're working primarily with our own clashes, our own negativities, trying to reduce our, our, our faults and uh, be less of a nuisance to other people as well as ourselves. And the goal of it is, of course, to conquer our clashes, our passion, aggression, ignorance, jealousy, and pride. 
Now in the Mahayana, we're working so that we can benefit all sentient beings. And here the, uh, the Lama is looked at as a spiritual friend, a friend in virtue. Uh, so on the Hinayana, the Lama is a respected elder. And here on the Mahayana, a spiritual friend. And so it's a closer relationship these spiritual friends of ours. Because it's more difficult to be on the Mahayana path than it is on the Hinayana path. And what's all happening in the world today is a really good example of this, that uh, if you are a Mahayana practitioner, you're not going to be taking sides uh, against one group or another that you're going to feel compassion for everybody that's suffering as a result of this, whether they be uh, in Washington, DC, or a street person uh, out in San Francisco or New York City. And so it takes a lot more, um, what would I say, a lot more practice, a lot more inner strength and so forth to be able to maintain that kind of equanimity in these days. And this would include the person at the grocery store that is making a complete scene of fighting with somebody else for toilet paper. On the Vajrayana path, then we have the Vajra master and Kempo Karta Rinpoche uh, was a Vajra master. Uh, all these Rinpoches are Vajra masters to the best of my knowledge, at least the ones in the Kagyu lineage that would be uh, invited to teach at KTD. So a Vajra master must be very accomplished to work with students. They must be, um, have permission to give Vajrayana empowerments, for instance. And here, the uh, Vajrayana path is more difficult. It's also much more quick than the Mahayana path. And so it's more difficult to be on it. The students are more difficult for the Vajra master. And I can tell you uh, what I saw in my three-year retreat uh, was that there were very difficult situations that arose in the, uh, the retreatants. And Rinpoche maintained his equanimity. Uh, and I've seen him in other situations. I'm going to talk a little bit later about Kempo Karta Rinpoche, but this is a little bit of, about the Lama. Basically, the Lama is considered to be actually in Vajrayana uh, superior to the Buddha because you can never meet the Buddha. All you can do is read things that have been written down that the Buddha said. Uh, and as I said earlier, one of the defects of just reading is that a book won't tell you if you have understood it properly or misunderstood it. So what we need to do here in terms of the Lama is meet great teachers, be inspired by them, learn from them, and slowly this devotion and trust develops. Uh, Karmapa has said that blind faith is to trust somebody without seeing clearly whether they are beneficial or not. And that helps uh, or hampers the development of wisdom. So we have to remember, this is a distinction between the kind of faith that Rinpoche was talking about in that quote, and um, true blind faith, where you're not being aware of whether what you're receiving from the Lama is beneficial or not. And it is good to examine a teacher before you become that teacher's student. And fortunately, we have 
His Holiness the Karmapa at the head of uh, our lineage. KTD is his monastery. He is keeping very careful watch over KTD. The Kenpos that are there are there because of Karmapa. Karmapa wanted them there. Kenpo Karta Rinpoche was there because Karmapa, the 16th Karmapa, uh, <coughs> asked him to be there and so on. So uh, you are in good hands if you go to KTD and these KTD uh, lamas. So I mentioned this in an earlier teaching that this uh, COVID-19 is really showing how unreliable and uncertain samsara is. We really can't go to it for refuge, at least in terms of long-term refuge. It has for probably all of us never been as uncertain as it is right now. So another reason for going to the Dharma. Now here's a quote by Tai Situ Rinpoche about devotion. And it is, I should say devotion happens because of compassion. And true devotion and true compassion are one. You cannot have true devotion and no true compassion. So we can Consider them as two wings. If, you de if your devotion is deep, then naturally your compassion is deep. If your compassion is deep, then naturally your devotion is deep. If either one is shallow, then the other is shallow too. So taking things a bit deeper like this, we see that compassion is also the crucial thing. And again, this is devotion to both the lamas and the dharma. And more specifically, a particular lama. It's really important in Vajrayana to have a, a lama that you go to for your instructions, which practices to do, how to do them, guidance, and so forth. If you have many different lamas in Vajrayana, uh, you become kind of a jack of all trades and a master of none. So finally here, I have some thoughts of my own about Kempo Karta Rinpoche. And I will have to say, I think about him often. Think about what he has done for me. Think about his qualities, what he has done for so many people. So I'm just going to uh, run down kind of a list that I came up with uh, and talk about him. And uh, the first is generosity. And this could easily apply to many other different lamas as well, that he was constantly giving his time to other people. He had really very little time of his own that uh, he was always busy doing things for other people, whether it be teaching, whether it be filling rupas, whether it be sewing, praying, and so on and so forth. He was constantly giving his knowledge and his wisdom to others. The same with giving dharma. And uh, in terms of material objects, um, he would give people willingly lots of things. And here's an experience that happened. Um, I was with a group of people. I just posted a picture on my Facebook page of uh, me and three-year retreat with the other men. So before the three-year retreat, there was a three-year uh, retreat, um, practice retreat or training retreat. That's a better word for it. And this was not sealed. You could come and go. And there was a man there 
who's, um, it might have been his wife's side, either a mother or a father, was seriously ill in, in the hospital, and they weren't sure if she or he was going to make it. And so the man had an interview with Rinpoche and said, can I take a break from this uh, this pre-retreat and then drive down to probably South Carolina or somewhere like that to see him with, and take my wife with me. And Rinpoche said, of course you can. And then he gave him like, uh, I don't know, maybe $800, $900 and said, don't drive, take the plane, you don't have time. Uh, and Rinpoche has done that. I've heard other stories about him doing that. And then here's, here's a story. I have seen him where people offer him money. He opens up the envelope, looks in it, counts it, and then gives most of it back and said, this is enough. So that's her generosity. Now, the next one is love. Uh, he loved all of us deeply. Uh, you could tell it just by being around him. When uh, at the end of a teaching or an empowerment, people would go up and make offerings to him and he would take uh, his two hands and put them on the side of your head around close to your ears and then bring them down to his head. And he would say, we're bumping heads. And his touch was so gentle it was uh, almost like he, I felt like he was just feeling, uh, holding something that was very, very fragile and he had to be very careful. And the last picture that I took of Rinpoche was of him with a little four-year-old girl um, holding her. And any of you who uh, got close to Rinpoche, I have many stories, I know it. Honesty, and this is what I came up with honesty, was inscrutable that he told us the truth, but frequently it was in such a way that we had discover, to discover the truth. And then it became our truth and not his truth. And again, for an example, going back to the three-year retreat, uh, this was probably about a year or so before the retreat. I had an interview with Rinpoche and I said, I was having second thoughts. Uh, Rinpoche, I don't know if I'm ready for the retreat yet. And he said, uh, it all depends on your motivation. Didn't say another word. And um, what I came to realize was that he was talking about the motivation of compassion to benefit all sentient beings. That if you didn't have that, you wouldn't complete the retreat. Or you wouldn't get what you needed to get out of the retreat. But on the other hand, he was never brutally honest either. Um, another one is gentleness, tenderness, that his activity was almost always peaceful, like Chenrezi. I sometimes would tell myself that he's the embodiment of compassion the embodiment of Chemrezi. And then the next is that uh, part of devotion is feeling an indebtedness to him. That uh, it's good to examine yourself and see how much he gave you, how much you benefited from him. And it is the Lama's job, whether it be Rinpoche or me, to push the students further than they would go by themselves. 
And so uh, in that vein, it's very easy to feel that none of us could have come nearly as far as we have without him if we are his students. Another part of devotion would be admiration, that we want to be like him. And then gratitude, a feeling of gratitude towards him. And this is why we make offerings to the lamas. It's uh, not that we're, we will accumulate merit, but it's like a recognition of we have received so much from him that we are almost bound to make offerings. And of course, the best offering you can make to a Lama is practice. So those are uh, my thoughts about uh, confidence, faith, trust, and devotion.